on his way. Devil is on his way. Devil is on his way, motherfucker. The devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Fall to your knees. Devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Motherfucker, he's on his way. Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Listener discretion is advised. The show contains graphic language and depictions of violence. It may not be suitable for all audiences. We say fuck a lot. Hey guys, welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. I'm politely rejecting you. Oh my God, you told me I suck. Hi. Yeah, let's just roll with it. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. My knucklehead husband. What are you doing? Hey cutie pie, what's up? Hey, a, baby, how's it shaking? Just the same old shit, you know? I mean, just trying to get by. Rolling with the punches? Yeah. Working nine to five? It is just trying to make a living. Trying to pour yourself a cup of ambition? Man, I tell you what, it's tough out there in the streets nowadays. It's hard out here for a pimp. I feel like we're all living like the street life. You know what I mean? This like, year has just been off the chain. I think it it's like twofold. It's like in some ways... I'm feeling appreciative, like, okay, I look at our life and think, you know, before all this happened, like, we really have been fortunate and whatever, and this just kind of shows me, like, I should be more grateful, I suppose, for yes. the quote-unquote normalcy. We were insulated to a degree because my job continued, and uh, your job continued, you know, you're hard at work making content, our wonderful listeners and supporters have kept listening and supporting us, our patrons. So, yeah, we've been super fortunate. You know, some families totally basically wiped out when this stuff started off. So, But at the same time, I don't know how people make it nowadays. I really don't. Yeah, I know. It's a struggle. And we're into the month of December, end of the year. And just looking back and reflecting, it's like, you know, this year's been really fucking tough. So hopefully... Maybe Mountain Murders has been able to shine a little bit of light into your life. Maybe give you a little bit of escape from, God, 2020 needs to just fucking stop. <laughs> I'm so ready for, like, a return to kind of how the things used to be. Well, unfortunately, I don't think 2021 is going to be magically better. It's probably not. We have some other huge crises that are coming. People are going to start getting thrown out of their homes left and right. Thank you for flinging poo at my dreams but, like an angry little monkey at the zoo. I don't appreciate you. Oh, uh, we do complain sometimes here at Mount Murders, and I'm sure some people hear this and are like, "Yeah, screw you guys." You know what I'm saying? They're dealing with a lot, a lot worse things than us. Well, everyone is in. The, I mean, we're all in this together, and a lot of us are in the same boat. Some of us have it worse, and I definitely extend sympathies to you and and i have empathy for all of you out there who really are struggling right now yeah i mean i just am struggling with like some mental health stuff you know i well, kind of that's back what i and was forth between like having a like being agoraphobic where i can't leave my house to some days feeling like oh, i have to get out of here i'm pulling my hair out and that's what i was but, trying to say extend our sympathies for people and um just you know hey if you tried today and you plan on waking up tomorrow and trying again Keep it up. You're doing a damn good job. You are, and we're proud of you, and we love you. And if you have shitty parents, we're your parents. We love you. Drop us an email. I will give you some positive encouragement in your life. Oh, I'll be a your daddy. virtual hug. Dylan will be your big daddy. You, you, you stepped on my I'll be your daddy. You knew that was coming. Oh, my God. Yeah, you're sitting over there looking like a snack today, by the way. Hey, Handsome and uh, guy. one other piece of advice I like want to Like a stand. chowder, like a chunky chowder. This is from me to the men right yeah. now. Okay? Real talk. Man oh. talk. Oh. Here I, at Mountain Murder. I feel Murders. like this is sexist. I don't like this. No, well, see, that's that's what a woman would say. <laughs> Guys, get you a moisturizing routine. If your wife or your woman has been glorious enough to get you to start this routine. Maybe their boyfriends are getting Or your boyfriend way. or whatever. Anybody, your loved one. Friends and lovers. Friends and lovers. If they have gotten you into a moisturizing routine, thank them because it will change your life. You will feel like a million bucks when you get done in the bathroom. And I'm going to tell you right now. You are looking like a shiny penny right now. When your woman comes in the bedroom or your loved one, 
your man, whoever it is, and they're all shined up and smelling good and they've been doing this stuff. You don't even know what they've been in there doing for the last 30, 45 minutes. That's for them. It's not for you. Now, it's going to make you feel better. You're going to be like, you smell good, but they feel like a million bucks. Oh, like I said, you're looking like a snack right now, like a chunky chowder. Oh, my God. Just drink you down, but I can't because there's little chunks of chowder and I have to chew it. And it's just it's t- so tasty. I'm telling you, my barber was out of town. I missed him before Thanksgiving. And I finally got a haircut. He waited for me after work yesterday because we have that type of relationship. You know, your barber is the bomb. I don't know if it's anything to do with the $5 tip I give him every single time he cuts my hair. But he does a great, great job. And we're friends. Well, speaking of grooming, since apparently that's how we're going to open the show, is talking about our grooming and skincare and beauty routines. I touched up the color uh, on my hair today. It's kind of like a fuchsia, magenta, red kind of color. And I decided to try dyeing my eyebrows. Oh, my God. You haven't let me see your eyebrows well, why? since I got home. Well, that's because I'm afraid you'll ridicule me, sir. Let Here, me I'll see. take my glasses off. You see that? Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, this just kind of gives a little hint of pink. Yeah. It's something different. I figure I'm in the house. No one's going to see me. So yeah. if I look really stupid, well, I mean, that's not much different than how I typically look. But yeah, that's stupid looking. That looks great. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> I'm just kidding, baby. It's cute. Yeah. So maybe you're being able to experience some new personal grooming techniques while you're trapped in the house. Uh, yes. And maybe I feel your self pedicure has never looked better. I feel bad for the jeans market. I think they're going to suffer greatly from this pandemic because I have an even more adverse reaction to when, when you're like, you have to put on real pants. That just makes me sad now. Well, I'll be honest. None of my pants, including my extra big pants, fit right now because of COVID. I did start a diet, <laughs> and today, well, I say because of COVID, but it's really just because I have no willpower or self-control, but, and I really like to eat cereal, but I decided to start my, my diet, a very popular diet that's worked for many, and I won't say the name because I don't sponsor the show, but there's two W's involved, <laughs> and I started tracking today, started some exercise today. And I'm um, feeling pretty good. So I got a detox. I've been doing way too much like junk food and just shitty food. And I feel like my body is begging for a vegetable. And you've told me to smack the after dinner bowl of cereal out of your hand, it's right? true. Do not let me have a popsicle or cereal or a little Debbie or anything like that. Okay. Okay. So we've ranted and rambled enough. So uh, we Have do- we lost you? Only the real fans are left. Oh, yeah. Check out my OnlyFans. I do great stuff over there. Oh, my gosh. Okay. (laughs) I want to get some shout-outs, Dylan. We have some excellent folks who joined us on Patreon. So, shout-out to our new patrons. They're sponsoring today's show. I want to give a big thank you to Peggy, Michael. I hope we are pronouncing your name right, girl. Casey, Rachel, and Allison for donating to our Patreon this week. And you can find us at patreon.com slash Podcast. For exclusive content and you can support the podcast. I also want to mention that we have an awesome patron, Megan. She's in Australia and she has requested a very specific true crime case from her homeland. Oh my God. And we are going to drop that story very soon. I'm working on it. I'm really excited. So on Patreon, we're going to venture outside of Appalachia to talk about an Australian true crime case. And it's a good one. Oh, my God. It's from Down Under. Yes. And we oh, we really need to go there someday. Yeah, it's pretty amazing seeing that some of the countries that people actually listen to Mount Murders, that blows us away. It, it, you know, blows our mind. All the great people here in the U.S. and Canada and everywhere. It's all over. The sign. U.K.? The U.K., Romania. Yeah. Estonia. France, Israel. Jap- Japan. Israel. Thank you, guys. Yeah, you got to say it right. Okay. So this is a lengthy true crime story today, and it's a very, very sad story, just to let you know ahead of time. And we'll be traveling into Canada for the first time. Yes, because I did not even realize the Appalachia Mountains, it stands clean up into Canada. It sure as hell does. So yes, for a very long time after I realized that, we've been wanting to do a case from all the way up there, our northern neighbors. And this case has been on my list. Contrary to popular belief, I am like a disorganized mess, but I really do have like this podcast scheduled ahead of time. So (laughs) I have like lists and lists and lists of cases that we're going to cover eventually. They're on the list. Just got to make, you know, got to get through the list. So this one's been on there for a while, Dylan. 
and it's a good one. Well, since we rambled a little, let's dive straight in. Shirley Jane Turner was born on January 28, 1961, to an American military member and a Canadian woman. Shirley's father was stationed at St. Anthony Air Station, which is located about 292 miles north of St. John's in Newfoundland, Canada. Am I saying that correctly? Newfoundland? I think that'd be better than the Newfoundland. Newfoundland. Of course, we are in Appalachia, so Newfoundland might be more appropriate. I'm not sure. It's Newfoundland. (laughs) Yeah. I think. Well, this base was closed in 1968, and it was known as being a radar base. Like, I think their primary mission was to, you know, make sure that, like, the Russians weren't sending over missiles and that kind of thing. Yes, I'm going to assume that they were maybe part of the early version of NORAD, the North American Defense something. And I didn't find whether her father was Air Force or Navy. Not sure. Anywho, Shirley's parents married in 1953 and moved to Wichita, Kansas to start their family. The couple had four children, including Shirley, and by 1968, all was not well in the Turner household and divorce was imminent. Shirley relocated with her mother back to Newfoundland, Canada to a tiny seaside village called Daniels Harbor. And because Shirley was born on U.S. soil, but she lived with her mother in Canada, she was granted dual citizenship. How cool is that? Well, that's pretty cool. I want dual dual citizenship. Well, what's the other country you'd want to be a citizen <laughs> Well, I, my grandfather lived in Canada for like 40-something years or 50-something years. Can I be Canadian, too? I want to go up there and smoke the Canadian weed. I just want to move to Canada. I feel like that'd be awesome. They're just like seem laid back. Though there's not a ton out there detailing Shirley's childhood, it seemed to be plagued with hardship. At some point, Shirley's mother did remarry a man who had become a father figure to the kids, and Shirley would have a very close relationship with him. Shirley's mother struggled, they were plagued with poverty, and they received welfare and lived quite frugally. Often, Shirley's family was nomadic and transient, kind of bouncing around from rental to rental, sometimes not being able to afford the basics. Yeah, it's funny that um, Canadians view, like, people in low-income housing and, and, you know, on welfare, in air quotes, I guess, um, quite differently than we do here in the U.S. It's true. Yeah, and, I mean, they they know that there are these people in this, you know, economic bracket, but um, they don't seem to... Resent? Resent and look down... on like, a helping hand? Yeah. Or having yeah. those social programs. Yeah, like if you uh, look up or, or look at the public housing areas and stuff, they, they seem to be designed quite differently. And um, so, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we may have some Canadian listeners who send us an email and will be like, no, we don't like those people. But <laughs> for the most part, just based on what we've seen, it just seems like it's viewed, just the society there views it a, dif- a bit differently than we do here in the United States. And though Shirley knew life in the struggle, she had her eyes on the prize. At 16, she enrolled in Sir Wilfred Greenfell College. Teachers and students were impressed by Shirley's intellect and personality. She was incredibly smart, pulling 98s and 100s in chemistry, but she was also really funny. In 1980, Shirley enrolled at Memorial University of Newfoundland in St. John with the goal of becoming a medical doctor. That's a lofty goal. Originally, she thought of being a nurse, but her friends told her with the grades she made, she should aim higher and become a doctor. After spending only a year at university, Shirley got married. She had two children with her husband, but her dreams were sidelined. And we see that quite a bit. Well, you never know. Get married young, have kids, start a family. You know, sometimes you do have to put those big dreams on hold. Yeah, you never know what life's going to throw at you. It was reported that after the birth of her first child, Shirley reportedly, like, began exhibiting controlling behaviors. How many times can I say reportedly in a sentence? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, over the household and just the goings-on? And just her husband and everything. I mean, it just seemed like she really had to be in charge of all. Oh, wow. You didn't have to have a baby to do that to me. <laughs> Look, one of us has to be the grown-up. It's true. By 1987, Shirley had divorced her first husband and married her high school sweetheart in 1988. Now, it is said that Shirley had an affair with a former lover, so I'm not sure if this was the high school sweetheart, but I assume so. She also had an abortion in 1988, and she had another daughter in 1990, 
but she and the second husband separated less than a year later. Shirley's ex retained custody of their one-year-old daughter, while Shirley's older children lived with her in St. John. Within two years, her children would move with their father, giving Shirley the opportunity to realign her plans. She enrolled again at Memorial University, where she eagerly earned her Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry. And by fall of 1993, Shirley was enrolled in medical school, further pursuing her studies. Shirley was a wonderful student who had no problems academically. And though her confrontational personality earned her a reputation as being kind of a bitch among her peers. I mean, was she really a bitch or just a strong woman? Well, she could have <laughs> just been a strong woman. There could have been people, you know, it sounds like the academic side of it, which, you know, and, and going on into medical school is a real big part, you know, very important and a lot of stress involved. It, that seemed to came came easy to her. I'm sure she worked hard, but some people just get it, you know, and I'm sure there might have been a little jealousy involved. Shirley's personal life didn't fare much better. Boyfriends would later say they would have periods of normalcy with Shirley and then periods of these like rage-filled arguments. And it was clear to some people in Shirley's life that she didn't seem to have a lot of empathy towards others and often displayed manipulative, self-serving tendencies. It would be six years before Shirley and her second husband divorced. So they separate. They're not living together. He retains custody of their child, but they haven't quite divorced yet. Now, just before graduating, Shirley was living in St. John, experiencing some financial hardships of her own. She allowed her estranged husband to move into the apartment in order to help care for her two older children sometime around 1994. Now, between 1993 and this time, there were troubling reports about Shirley. Someone reported alleged child abuse. Now, Shirley supposedly targeted a lot of frustration at her oldest daughter, often striking her in the face swearing and cursing at the child, as well as leaving the girl unsupervised at night and on weekends. Well, um, none of that sounds very healthy. That can't be good. And having an estranged spouse move in, I mean, I guess it could work out, but it just seems to me like that would create a, a kind of a strange dynamic in a household. Some maybe unwanted, unnecessary tension? Well, I mean... Yeah, it's, I mean, one or the other might be thinking, hey, is this going to blossom back into a relationship? Maybe one of them wants it, too. I mean, there's just so many variables that could strain the household itself in a relationship like that. The children were often struck with open hands and belts, and though it was reported to authorities, the case was closed by child services without even like having interviewed Shirley at all. How does that work? So just not doing their full job. Now, around this time, Shirley announced she would no longer be caring for her children full time because she wanted to focus on her medical studies. Shirley told people pretty openly that her children were hindering her studies. Can you make that declaration? <laughs> I'm going to put our kids on notice. Excuse me, kids. You are really cramping our style. Yeah, I mean, I just... We know you didn't ask to be born, but you're really kind of a cock block yep and you're fucking shut up yep and you cost money and at this point i'm just making a public declaration this can happen on like aisle 10 of walmart on a busy day a public declaration that i'm no longer going to support you or let you stand in the way of my dreams you were hindering yeah my dreams okay so <laughs> if you can find your own way back home we're going to start practicing now you're an adult gosh our kids would be lost yeah, they'd still be at aisle 10 when the store closed, <laughs> and then authorities would call us, and it'd be a big thing. They'd be like, do you know what your address is? And they'd be like, no, no, <laughs> even though they're teenagers. Yup. Yeah, I don't know. Around 1995, the children went to live with Shirley again for a period, but all were back with their fathers by 1997. So it's just kind of back and forth with these kids. Seems like they didn't have a lot of stability. It was also in the late 1990s that the man who Shirley considered a father figure fell ill and passed away. And it was at a time when her mother had recently left him and was separating from him that he died. And emotionally, Shirley was quite distraught. Some people described a change in her at this time as if she kind of started going off the rails after having an extreme emotional breakdown. So she's already kind of a confrontational person described that way by people. 
strong personality. I think it's safe to say. Maybe short tempered just with the way she treats her children. Yeah, definitely. Uh, some of that's very abusive? unhealthy, uh, uh, straight out abusive. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. And then she has this big emotional traumatic event in her life. Her mother separating from her father figure, and then he dies. So that would be hard for anyone to deal with. On top of uh, all the rest of the stuff going around in her mind, I could see that causing a significant issue. Sometime around 1996, I should mention, Shirley began having an affair with a much younger man. And the relationship, mostly physical, lasted about two years. When the guy tried to break it off with Shirley because he had taken a new job and would be moving to the United States, Shirley freaked out. She called him constantly, and once he moved and stopped taking her calls, she drove... Well, first he moved to Halifax in Canada. And she drove all the way to Halifax where she could just cuss him out in person. And at some point, he was so exhausted dealing with Shirley that he actually moved to the United States, like trying to get away from her. And didn't tell her, I wouldn't tell her where I moved to. Well, guess what? That didn't uh, matter because she's still following him. Now, at some point, she had shown up at his apartment, refused to leave. He lets her in, just he's so worn down, like dealing with her. That she stayed for like a month and he couldn't get rid of her. My God, Shirley. And during that time, he said that Shirley abused him by striking him repeatedly in the face with her stiletto. Well, that sounds like a very unsavory house guest. And as I mentioned, he moved to Pennsylvania in hopes of escaping Shirley. But she showed up in the U.S. wearing a black dress, had a dozen roses, standing in his doorway claiming she had taken pills and she had a suicide note on her person. You know, I mean, you should never take any in someone claiming self harm lightly, but with a, a person like this who is this type of personality, I would venture a guess that this is a tension getting um, behavior. And I could only imagine how totally done and over this whole thing this guy must have been at that point. Well, no one wants a stalker. No, stalking's not cool. So, anyone out there listening to this right now, st- Actively stalking someone? Stop. If you're that psycho ex, don't. Just don't. Just don't. Just move on with your life. Because if there was any little grain in them of, you know, maybe we can make this work, stalking and keeping on and on and public scenes and things of that nature does not help them feel like they want to be with you. It doesn't work like that. And if you're not stalking your ex, here's a reminder during the holiday season Don't have drinks and text your ex. Just don't do it. Don't drunk text (laughs) your ex ever. No. In anger or in booty call mode. Oh, God. Yeah. In 1998, Shirley graduated medical school and started her residency on the north coast of Newfoundland. And by all accounts, she excelled at her residency, but had conflicts with doctors and staff members. Shirley expected special treatment, often making certain schedule demands. Like, I have children, I can't work these days. But they didn't live with her, mind you. And causing a scene when she felt she was being treated unfairly. Senior physicians would state that Shirley would often lie to their face and about simple stuff. And she would become furious if she was called out on her bullshit. Well, there seems to be evidence of some significant personality disorders here in Shirley. The second period of her residency was also marked with trouble. Shirley reportedly lied constantly and had excessive absences from work. Patients refused to work with Shirley, and many of the staff were afraid to say anything to her, especially alone, because there was no telling what she might say or do. Which just doesn't seem like a proper personality to be a doctor. I mean, I would hate to be a patient or a subordinate of hers. Working with someone like that in any setting, that would suck. Well, to a person be around, but like this is scary. In medicine, I mean, have you ever been with someone, and I don't professionally or just in general, that their personality was so overwhelming and that they were so like manipulative and narcissistic and that kind of thing that you were afraid to be alone with them because you were worried about what they would say happened afterwards. I mean, I've actually worked. And been around people like that. That I didn't want 
I didn't like want to say something to them alone because I was like, well, there's no telling what the hell they're going to go and lie about because they're nuts. Well, that's not cool. But let alone in a, a medical setting where you have pe- people right involved and you, you like say you don't agree with what they're doing or want more information and you're scared to even ask, you know, for more clarification on something. I mean, that would just be a horrible setting. Yeah, this has got to make work difficult. And people describe Shirley as a pleasure to be around as long as she was getting her way. She could be charismatic and friendly one minute, but if challenged, she'd turn into a rage monster. And that was literally how someone described her, as a rage monster. Others thought Shirley's bedside manner was an act. She could be so sweet and charming, but her co-workers didn't feel she had any real care or concern for the patients. Like, everything was like she's just putting on an act. And despite Shirley's stalking and otherwise erratic behavior, she was given the green light as fit to practice medicine. <laughs> How does that work? This story is plagued with multiple opportunities where if someone had maybe pursued it, the right thing, that Shirley's out of control, like we might not have ended up where we are at the end of the story, if that makes sense. No, but I've heard this in um, other stories, uh, Dr. Death, part one and two. When you have these practitioners, I'm not saying she's a Dr. Death, but I'm saying when you have these people, they're very good at the book work and the academics associated with uh, getting their medical degree, that that kind of gives them... Like, you know, professors will remember, oh, they were very good. I never had to, you know, they were excelled in our classes. They were good on all that. It's almost like it gives them a kind of pass as they get on into the profession, into the real world of you. Well, but didn't you, you know, didn't you know they, they, you know, went to this prestigious school or they won these awards? And I don't know. It's almost like it gives them some kind of cover. Well, we but already then they're see like a that shitty person. Like child services is failing her children. This medical school, this residency is failing in that they're giving her the green light, even though they know she's maybe not quite suited for the job. Well, if they interview people she's been working with, learn residency, you know, doing that under, you know, superiors, I, I don't think she would get a passing grade from all these people that she's worked with and patients included. In 1998, an American man named Andrew Bagby attended Memorial University for medical school. And it was at this time that Shirley met Andrew. And by 1999, the pair were together. Turner was 13 years older than Andrew. Bagby was also a military brat, so the pair likely felt as though they had a connection, maybe kindred spirits. And friends thought they were an odd couple because, I mean, there was the obvious age difference. And Shirley was overtly sexual, always making inappropriate jokes and comments. And it just didn't really sit well with his friends. They well, thought she was kind of brash and bawdy. Well, I'd be a little uncomfortable. And you got to think about, this was like the 90s. It was kind of a different time. I mean, I think people are so much more casual about making sex jokes or inappropriate comments. But at the time, it just, you know, it's just not a thing that people did. In the early, no, early 90s, people were still, I mean, we still have a long way to go. Like, you know, a a woman's breast is like, oh, my God, you know, but you can cuss and you can call women bitches and whores. But, oh, my God, God forbid her breast. She breastfeeds her child. Yeah. I mean, that's still a conversation, (laughs) which blows my mind. And guess what? And any guy who would sit there and ogle, ogle, however you say, a woman who's putting her breast into a little tiny baby's mouth is, I mean, come on, guys, get it together. There's plenty of other places to see titties. Andrew had, oh, yeah? Where are those places? Well, I've been told. Andrew- At my bedroom, girl. <laughs> in <laughs> oh, the mirror. Well, you do have some really nice speak ups. That's right. Andrew had a, you've got some big naturals, Dylan. Mm. You can make your own OnlyFans for real. Oh, I already have OnlyFans. That wasn't a joke earlier. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Where's that extra cash? Oh, you don't have any OnlyFans yet? You just have the site set up, but no one's actually paid you oh, yet? Oh, people pay to go to that? Well, I guess they're not paying you. Andrew had a very different background from Shirley. Although, you know, his dad was in the military, Andrew's father was in the Navy, and he earned a degree in engineering. His mother was from England, and she was a nurse and eventually became an OBGYN nurse practitioner. So he had a pretty charmed life. He was described as a wonderful baby and a really good student from kindergarten to college. 
He graduated with a degree in biology from UC Irvine, but he failed to get into medical school, and he was so disappointed about this. So he took a job and then decided to apply to about 60 different medical schools. Oh, so he wants to get into medical medical school no matter what. Yes. He became engaged to a woman named Heather, and in the spring of 1996, he got good news that he had been accepted at Memorial University. Though he and his fiance tried to live together in Canada, it just didn't quite work out. Initially, Andrew denied to his parents that he was seeing this much older woman who was twice divorced and had three kids. He explained that Shirley was not really interested in anything serious and just wanted to have a good time. A no-strings-attached relationship. Is that the way he viewed it, or is that the way he kind of described it to his parents? Well, that's how he described it to his parents. Okay. But I'm not real sure if maybe he thought this was how, you know, maybe this is what he thought, for real. He was focusing on his studies, and she was finishing up her residency. So again, he's just like a young guy looking for a good time. Intrigued by this older woman. She freaked him. You That's think? what you're saying. I don't know what that means. How you know what that means? Like she gave him a rim job or something? Oh, man, she did something that no one's ever done to him. Okay. And, oh my God, I feel like I freaked you. In August of 2000, Shirley was hired at Trimark Physicians Corporation, which is located in Sac City, Iowa. Her boyfriend, Andrew Bagby, was working on a surgical residency in Syracuse, New York. And though there was still quite a bit of distance between the pair, they seemed committed to making this relationship work. Now, during the first year, Shirley visited Andrew seven times in Syracuse. He visited her only one time in Iowa. Well, we know Shirley does not mind traveling for love. So it might fit with what you were saying, Dylan. I mean, maybe he really did view it. As a more casual kind of hookup. It's like a girls of summer thing in his head, maybe, right? The booty call relationship, hookup, what have you. Well, this caused Shirley concern. She was needy, and he wasn't giving her the attention she felt she deserved. I understand that. Well, I mean... You don't give me the attention I deserve, Dylan. She sounds so as a... uh, Described as having a lack of empathy, right? Which... Number one goes against being a doctor, in my opinion, if you're not very empathetic, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, narcissist, she sounds like a full-blown narcissist, almost borderline to the dangerous side. Because you can be narcissistic and it actually be uh, good, a good thing. I think to, if you're to a degree, like if you have a strong, uh, a, com- a certain confidence comes with narcissism and things like that. Or that determination, that Determination drive, and, right? and, and like you can focus on things. You can kind of push everything else to the side and uh, hyper focus on some things. But then you, when you know you get up the scale to where you got no empathy, you're narcissistic to the point where you got to control conversations and, you know, events or, you know, any situation. You got to be the center of attention. I think that might be why she would, you know, the things like the uh, Kraus jokes and things of that nature you know what i mean even negative attention narcissists will accept that love me pet me pay me attention yeah but uh and then the the mood swings so i mean i don't know what exactly all i'm certainly no expert we're working with with her but she has some very um the obsession she sounds like your ex <clears throat> no um i don't know if she'd ever make it medical school well uh, yeah well like a dumb version of your ex hey that sounds right. Uh, or your number, or your ex is the number. Okay, anyway. In Shirley's mind. That's, I knew what you meant. I love shit talking on here with you, baby. In Shirley's mind, Andrew's lack of interest in visiting her in Iowa had to mean that he was pulling away and no longer interested, which of course didn't go over well with Shirley. She's not going to allow anyone else to decide something like that. It's going, you know, if she's not controlling it or making the decisions, that's not going to work for her. Well, and people with, personality disorders just what i've studied about the issues uh, it seems like rejection is something they don't handle very well no typically well no because they're not in control now and i mean just this type of personality disorder she's dealing with she's a little she's lost the control and we see she has controlling tendencies right already. she doesn't want to be rejected she doesn't she wants everything to be on her own terms Dylan, let's go ahead and pause for a quick commercial break, and we will be right back. I 
at one point, it is reported that Shirley may have burglarized Andrew's apartment. She burgled his apartment? She had allegedly forgotten to lock the door to his apartment. His laptop, Palm Pilot, and a few other items were taken. An officer who took down the report was convinced that Shirley had stolen the items, but Andrew refused to believe that she would do this. She made substantially more money than he did, but it probably wasn't so much about money, but more the theft was about spying on Andrew. But it just didn't make sense to him. But, I mean, that's funny that the, you know, the cop kind of maybe seen through her act, if you will. He's having a limited contact with this woman. Just another, you know, he sees these situations all the time every day. And it sounds like he wasn't buying it at all. A Palm Pilot. That's about the most, like, 90s thing you can have, right? That or a Blackberry. A <laughs> Palm Pilot. One time I had a trivia team called Harry Palm Pilots. Oh. Yeah. In the fall of 2001, Andrew moved to Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Aren't they known for, isn't that where Rolling Rock is made? Rolling Rock beer? Latrobe? I know it's in, made in Pennsylvania. I think it's Latrobe. I single-handedly raised the price of Rolling Rock at a local establishment here one year. Did you? Yep. When was this? Because when I started getting them, they're like, uh, I think we have some. They pulled some out of like, the very back of the cooler, and it was kind of old. And by the time I got done with them, the price had went up, and they had a lot in stock. When was this? Oh, years ago. Yeah, that's funny. Back about 2001, actually, Rolling Rock was my jam. That was, like was my college beer. It was at O'Malley's, if I that tells you how long ago it was. Rolling Rock and Yingling, especially the like black and tan, Yingling black and tans on the bottle. But now I don't care for Rolling Rock that much. <laughs> you don't care for beer that much. Well, it just makes me feel sick, okay? Because I can't have wheat. Okay, so he moved to Latrobe for another residency, realizing surgery wasn't really his cup of tea, because he had started out doing his first residency as a surgical doctor, not for him, so he moved to Latrobe, and he was going to do more of like a family, like family physician, family practice, which he really loved, but just before this, Shirley broke contract with her job in Sac City to move to Council Bluffs, Iowa for a different job. And in October, Shirley bought a Phoenix Arms HP-22 firearm and some 22 caliber ammunition, and she started taking firearms lessons. Oh my God, Shirley, no. <laughs> yeah. She don't need to be proficient with a firearm. I should also mention, and I didn't put this in my notes, but in the, in the book I read, which I'll talk about at the end of the episode, when she broke that contract with the Sac City job in Iowa... She owed them something like $166,000 because of, like, payday advance loans and stuff she'd taken out. Oh, when she left the other job to go to Iowa? Well, when she left the Sac City job in Iowa, she broke her contract to move to Council Bluffs. But oh, she had already okay. borrowed, like, $166,000 from the company. Wow. So she had a huge debt. I wonder if my company will let me borrow She needed to pay back. Money. Now, during the fall months... Shirley became increasingly anxious about her standing with Andrew. She called him incessantly, mostly with harassing phone calls, and was extremely possessive of him. To the point that the switchboard operator, where he was working, like, knew Shirley by name, and they didn't have a very good relationship. Well, you, that's not cool to call someone's work that much. It's just inappropriate. It's very unprofessional. And I think that should be reserved for emergencies and things of that nature. Unless you're at a very laid back place and everyone's friendly, then whatever. But if it, it, that uh, sounds like a you know switchboard operator, some you know kind of a big operation. Or well, something. he's at work. He's yeah, doing he's a, a residency. Like he's trying to become a doctor. Why would you call him constantly? He's probably busy. And she went through so inconsiderate. She went through that. She was did her residency. Yeah, so she understands it's hard work. All doctors talk about how hard it is, the long hours, the stress of it, learning on the fly, kinda. You know, because you have to get the hands on experience. And yeah, that's very inconsiderate for her to do him like that during his residency. When in Pennsylvania, friends and even his parents noticed he seemed very uneasy when Shirley was around. She'd seemed fine, but Andrew was on edge. Andrew was thriving in Pennsylvania. Being in that family practice setting was more fitting than being the surgical doctor. But he was growing weary of Shirley's harassment. 
often blowing up on her and people would hear him yelling and this would be at work like what is your fucking problem and then he would hang up and then she'd leave like 30 voicemails on his cell phone or his home phone man you can only take so much from someone acting like this during a visit in September, Shirley intercepted a phone call to Andrew from his ex fiance Heather, whom he'd kept in close contact with. I mean, they were still very good friends. After they'd broken up and Heather had moved back to California, she actually lived with his parents. So they were like best friends. They just knew they, you know, they couldn't be together romantically. Shirley told the woman that she was pregnant, but she wasn't going to keep the baby. Why would you? Why would you even tell anyone your business like that? Shirley told Heather she planned to have an abortion after the couple attended a wedding together. That's very strange. That's very strange. Very strange. On October 13th, Shirley announced to Andrew that she was three months pregnant. She also told Andrew's ex fiance that she now intended to keep the baby. However, Shirley wasn't actually pregnant. But Andrew doesn't know this yet. <laughs> If I was the ex-fiance, I'd be like, oh, okay, thanks for letting me know. Like, don't call me anymore. I don't want to talk to you. Just because this is such a weird subject matter, honestly. That's a conversation for you and Andrew to have. She visited him in Latrobe at the end of October, days after she finished her shooting lessons. The couple argued about Andrew's relationship with a new female friend, Andrew had been friendly with both a blonde doctor and he had even asked a radiology tech out on a date. And during this time, the radiology clerk received two mysterious phone calls. The first directed her to a public library. She showed up. She found nothing. When she got home, another call was waiting. It was actually on her answering machine, so a message, and it was telling her to ask Dr. Bagby about the beautiful blonde lady he's been seen with. And it also said, Andrew Bagby hurts people. <laughs> so, would you follow the directions from a mysterious phone call? No. Like, yeah, meet me in the alley back by the dumpster behind the Chick-fil-A. Well, this was all after Andrew had told Shirley that he had asked the woman on a date. According to Andrew and Shirley, they kind of had like a don't ask, don't tell policy where... Their relationship was open as long as they, you know, they were long distance. I guess when you can have pose in different area codes, as long as you didn't talk about it. I, I mean, I guess some people can pull that off, but I, I just don't know that I'd want to be in a relationship like that, long distance or not. You're so monogamous, baby. Well, I love you. I love you. It's so cute. And I couldn't imagine being with someone else. Not same. Who else would tolerate my farting on them? No one. I know, right? You don't fart on me. Only when you're asleep and you can't. Respond. Oh my God. Is that why I keep getting pink eye? Dude, I totally. Do you hover over I my totally face? I totally Dutch oven you like all the time. You hover over my face and fart directly in my eyes? It's a passive aggressive retaliation for your constant snoring. Well, I can tell you the conjunctivitis doesn't feel passive aggressive. Well, you haven't had conjunctivitis. You're full of shit. <laughs> um, just wait till you snore again tonight. I hear that that's a, actually a side effect of farting in someone's face. I had some boiled eggs earlier. Can't wait to scoop those out for you, Dylan. I'm not going to sleep. That, okay, well, that was gross, and our listeners are probably like, what the fuck? But by now, you're accustomed to the fact that I just, whatever f comes out of my fucking mouth, it just happens. Scoop those out? Yeah. I think that was the line. I'm scoop out that for you, baby. And then on November 3rd, Shirley admitted she'd made up the story about being pregnant. She had hoped a baby would seal a commitment between she and Andrew. He was furious, as you can imagine. Well, the baby may change the dynamics of the relationship, depending on what they both want, but you have to have a real, really have a baby. I mean, what are you going to do? Go down to the store and pick up a baby? Well, he decided to end things for good. He put Shirley on a plane back to Iowa, feeling relief that this relationship was finally over. This was the trigger that really sent Shirley over the cuckoo clock. Now, on the same day... Andrew was supposed to have a date. Once Shirley was on the plane, Andrew stopped by a drugstore in Latrobe. He bought a box of condoms. And I mention this because they were stamped with a manufacturer's number. 
and they would later be found in Shirley's Council Bluffs, Iowa apartment. Oh, so that proves that she had contact with Andrew after he bought the condoms. Yes. Okay. November the 5th, 2001 started out like any other day. Andrew Bagby was gearing up for a new day at work when Shirley presented herself at his apartment. She just won't quit. He left her there, and he walked across the street for work. He went on to make his morning rounds, and his supervisor, I'm sorry, his supervisor noticed that something was wrong and kind of pressed Andrew about what was going on. Because Andrew's, like, always in a good mood, but he seemed pissed and just grumpy. The supervisor learns that Shirley had been at Andrew's apartment that morning, pounding on his door. Andrew said something along the lines of, that psychotic bitch was at my apartment this morning. He confided in his supervisor that he was supposed to meet Shirley later at Keystone National Park. Well, his supervisor warned him not to go. I think that's sound advice. Andrew agreed to meet up with his supervisor around 7.30 that night he was going to come over to the guy's house. They were going to share a six-pack after he met with Shirley. After all, Andrew was desperate for a clean break from her. Her threatening behavior, the constant phone calls, and the harassment needed to end. Andrew thought maybe meeting her one last time would offer his former lover some closure. That's yeah, just not how it works with these people that have this type of personality. There's never True. one last time for them because every time you interact with them, even if it's negative, negatively, that's a win for them. But we've all been there at some point, right? The mopey ex wants to meet and against our best interests, we're allowed to be guilted into that meeting, that final goodbye. Well, I mean, I've done that before and it's always a bad idea. And you maybe or have that hope in the back of your mind that it really will be final some closure for both of you and, and everyone can move on so i can't fault andrew i've done the same thing it's again it's just never a good idea well it's easy to armchair quarterback these types of situations but when your emotions are involved you know well and when you've been so worn down by someone well there's and that too just crazy behavior. Well, I'll tell you're you. You're probably not in your right mind. You're just like, what do I have to do to get this person to leave me the fuck alone? Well, and in these instances, you also, the mindset could be, if I don't go meet her. What will happen? What else will happen? What other crazy shit's going to happen? So that's a good motivator as well. Yeah, you're right, Dylan. Good point. Andrew left in the afternoon, and he drove 20 miles north to a satellite clinic in Salzburg, Pennsylvania. He worked there until just a little before 5 p.m., he left the clinic, stopped off for a six-pack, and then went to meet Shirley. Now, during the time he was working, Shirley's at his apartment, and she's ransacking it. Yeah, I, I, that's not cool. She found his box of condoms. She phoned her job in Council Bluffs to say she had a migraine and wouldn't be in until the following day. She browsed eBay. She checked her email and waited for evening to fall. Now, the meeting place was an isolated park with a gravel parking lot. Andrew called Shirley, according to his cell phone records, just before arriving. And sometime around 8.30 p.m., Andrew Bagby was shot dead in the Keystone parking lot. See, that, that's right, that right there, he should have made this, made sure it was public, her, their meeting place. Because I'm telling you, he's got to know that she's an unstable type of person. He's got to know that from all this stuff that's happened this entire time. And being around her. So that, that unfortunately, was a mistake on his part. A hunter reportedly saw Andrew and Shirley's vehicles in the lot around 6 p.m. Around 11.30 p.m., Shirley Turner placed a phone call from Cleveland, Ohio. Investigators pinned 8.30 as the time of death because Cleveland was about three hours away from Keystone. So if she left at 8.30, she would be in Cleveland by 11.30. So she is headed straight out after murdering this man. Andrew Bagby was shot five times. A six bullet was found nearby. The first two slugs went through the left side of his chest and his left cheek, and the second slug exited behind his left ear. He spun around, falling on his face in the gravel, and the next two shots were aimed at his rectum. Then a close-range execution-style shot to the back of the head. Well, that's a... 
overkill. I mean, you can tell there's emotion involved here. She wants to make sure he's di- dead. Almost shooting him in the rectum area. Almost aiming at his crotch, if you will, from behind. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely personal. Andrew's body was discovered around 6 a.m. by a man who was rummaging through the park's trash cans, searching for aluminum cans. Once in Council Bluffs, Shirley spent the next few days calling Andrew's parents in California, asking if they'd heard from him. That's typical behavior of someone like this, trying to seem innocent, trying to lay out kind of an alibi. Well, I've been looking for him, yeah. She expressed she'd had no luck in reaching him and asked if anything was going on. It was on November 6th that police in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, phoned Andrew's parents in California to deliver dreadful news that their son was dead. When Andrew's mother phoned Shirley, Shirley told her, oh, I already knew. Okay. A policeman had phoned Shirley and asked her, like, not to be the bearer of the bad news. So Shirley agreed, and instead she went to the mall to distract herself. Well, yeah, that's what you do when you find out the person that you care for has been murdered. Yeah. You just, you go down to the journeys, and you try on a new pair of vans. You go stand in line <laughs> to wait to get an American Eagle and look at all the clothes that'll never fit you. You might get you a delicious pretzel from the, you know, from Auntie Annie's or whatever. Sabara's Pizza. I mean, what the fuck? Immediately, the name Shirley Turner was top of the suspect list. While Andrew's family, friends, and colleagues were reeling with grief, investigators were combing the Keystone State Park for evidence. Forensic, uh, forensics collected shell casings, cigarette butts, and tire castings, but no weapon was recovered at the scene. And the bloody area where Andrew's body was found lay covered in sand in the gravel parking lot off Route 981. Andrew's supervisor relayed that Shirley had made a Monday morning appearance on Andrew's doorstep. His parents took note as Shirley had told them she had been at home in bed with a migraine on Monday. Now it was on Tuesday, November the 6th, around 2 p.m. that Shirley was notified of Andrew's death. On this call, her behavior was really strange. She kept diverting the detective from Andrew and was asking about her accent. Because, again, this is a, like, um, detective in Pennsylvania calling her, and she's in Iowa, and she's asking, like, can you tell I'm from Canada? Do I sound Canadian? Which was just really weird for this detective. Like, what the hell is she talking about? Well, yeah, anytime someone does, like, simple kind of non-related small talk, or, you know, very uh, no emotion and stuff, that that typically tips detectives off like something's going on with this person. Yeah, the detective just thought it was really strange. She said she'd last spoken to Andrew on Sunday night, and Shirley informed the detective they'd had a romantic relationship but dated other people. She mentioned he had a date on Saturday night, and Shirley claimed she'd spent all day Monday at home in bed with a headache. On Tuesday morning, she had went to the car wash, the post office, and then into work around 11.30 a.m., She admitted to owning a gun and agreed to turn it in to the local Council Bluffs police for some ballistics testing. Five hours later, Shirley called back and reported the gun missing. Oh, wow. The case was in her car, which had not been broken into, but the gun was still missing. So she just didn't know where the gun had gone. I don't know what happened to it. I was walking around doing some trick shots, throwing some shots, you know, up in shot puts up in the air, shooting those. You know. Someone must have taken it out of my locked car, but oh gee, they didn't d- break out a window or punch out the lock. Or take to grab the case. They took the gun out. <laughs> yeah. It's the weirdest thing. It makes so much like, sense. Everything's here but the gun. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Shirley. Oh, and yes, it has my fingerprints on it, and it's recently been discharged, but don't worry about that. And I was shooting earlier yesterday. Some crows. So, if you run a gun powder residue test on my hands uh, that's why there's gunpowder on them because there were crows and they were shitting on my car i don't know oh my god what i would shoot that crow that comes up every morning and calls his buddies when i work off night shift i would shoot that guy if i had a gun (laughs) shirley was interviewed a second time by detectives and during the interview shirley said she obtained a gun permit on october 11th 
She purchased her gun October the 16th. Since moving to the United States, she thought she needed a gun for protection. She admitted to taking shooting lessons at a range in Omaha, but she denied having taken the gun with her to La Trobe when she visited Andrew. Shirley said the gun must have been stolen from her car, and she didn't feel like someone had broken into her apartment and taken it. When officers asked what happened to the gun, she said something along the lines of, I don't really have a good answer for you. Okay. She denied knowing anyone who'd want Andrew dead. And no matter how much pressure these seasoned investigators put on Shirley, she simply denied knowing what happened to her gun and what happened to Andrew. Won't crack. So he's shot dead with a twenty two caliber weapon. They they know that, I'm sure. And she bought a twenty two caliber weapon. And um but now she mysteriously can't find it to so they can compare it. Well if it was upper butt, she'd know it. Sorry, I feel like a seven-year-old when I said that. But the following day, she phoned a detective to say she was not truthful and had actually given the gun to Andrew. Okay, so again, why would you lie about that? Why wouldn't you just say, because that would kind of fit your, I, th- I think she thought about it and figured that fits the story better. Andrew had the weapon on him. Someone must have gotten the weapon and killed him with it. That's actually wouldn't be a bad thing to say in the beginning as a lie. Her statements evolved from, I was home with a migraine, to, my gun is missing, to, I took Andrew the gun on the night I met him in the park, and he was killed. But still, the gun was never found. God. Yeah, I know. It's just like, come on, lady. The evidence against Shirley was mostly circumstantial. Five different people had confided in detectives that Andrew wanted out of this relationship with her. Sure, that was motive, but it wasn't enough to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she had killed him. Also, Shirley's claims to Heather the ex that she was pregnant and that Andrew wanted her to have an abortion were also a possible motive for murder. Like, she wanted to have a baby, he didn't. Right, if the baby, if she was really pregnant. Also, the gun Shirley owned had a malfunction where it would sometimes kick out unspent shell casings. And one was found like that near Andrew's body. He had been shot five times, but there was a six shell casing nearby. Now, is that a known to the model? It is known to the specific gun that Shirley owns. Okay, not not someone saying, "Hey, Shirley's gun does this," but known to mount that type of that model gun is known to malfunction like that. Yes. Okay. That brand and everything. So that added to the possibility that Shirley's gun was the murder weapon. Shirley had clearly been very jealous of Andrew's potential date. She called and left that woman messages, remember? So was jealousy a motive? There seemed to be several motives. Potential motives. Yeah. About three weeks after the murder, Shirley's ex from Canada, the one who had moved to Pennsylvania to try to get the fuck away from her, actually spoke to police about his relationship with Shirley. Really? He described the trouble started with phone calls, usually late at night, with many saying things like, you will die. Man, what the hell, dude? He explained her weird psycho behavior like stalking and how she would say she was not going to be dumped. Like, you can't break up with me. I will not be dumped. She showed up numerous times on his doorstep, though she lived 10 hours away. Well, that's almost a version of if I can't have you, no one else will. Well, it totally is, and we see a pattern here. I mean, she did the same thing to Andrew where she would was willing to drive thousands of miles, just show up on his doorstep. That that's unsettling. That that would be that would be very disconcerting to me. It's frightening. Yeah. Cell phone records were finally released to detectives on November twenty first, showing that Shirley was in Latrobe on the day of the murder with her talking near Chicago and Indiana, which would have traced back, you know, her route to Iowa. The phone call to her nurse on Monday morning, stating that she had a migraine, was traced to the Pittsburgh area. Also, the condoms that were found in Shirley's apartment were bearing the serial number for the condoms in Pennsylvania that Andrew had purchased on Saturday. Now, she took those condoms from Andrew's apartment, or, yeah, from his apartment, and took them with her. And took them all the way back home. That's strange. That's I mean, it's almost like she was keeping them on purpose. Yeah. Like, I mean, I wouldn't say trophy so much, but like, haha, I, I have these. And he definitely won't be able to have these condoms and use them. 
because I have them. Yeah, well, he won't be able to use them now because he's dead. Damn, Shirley. Andrew's computer also showed that Shirley had logged into her email, and it was for work, so it was one of those um, emails that you have like a lot of security and password to get through to log in, and so they found this on his computer. So it's definitely her using his computer. Right. There was no one else who would have known, like the extra security passwords and all that to log in. On November 12th, Shirley packed a bag and purchased a round-trip ticket to Canada with the help of her attorney. Because she's lawyered up. So she's trying to leave? Yup. Shirley would never step back foot in the United States. Her attorneys will claim that Shirley did not flee, but only went to Canada for emotional support. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it doesn't matter the reason you leave the area when you've been, you know, accused or charged. It's fleeing, sir. On the day she arrived in Canada, her 18-year-old son suffered a serious injury in a car wreck, which gave Shirley an excuse to extend her stay there. It was also in November that Shirley announced she was actually pregnant. Okay. While attending a wedding together just before Andrew's murder, she shared a room with him. So, I guess that's how that happened. And she probably made him have sex with her. <laughs> yeah, probably. A warrant was issued for Shirley's arrest on November 29th, 2001. And by December the 6th, she retained a Canadian lawyer who was known for being an extradition expert. A Canadian judge released her on conditions that she surrender her passport, post $75,000 in assurities, and she was not allowed to contact specific people, meaning like Andrew's parents. I should also mention that that $75,000 that she had to post came from her psychiatrist. He put up the money for her, and that was like a big like, ethical problem, and he would later get in trouble for that. Well, yeah, I could see a conflict of interest there. And, and what what year was this when she he, he made her give up her passport? This is 2001. Okay. The extradition hearings went into 2002, and by this time, Andrew's parents were preparing to fight for custody of their unborn grandchild. In Canada... A baby is not recognized by law as a person until it's born. So they couldn't do anything until the child was here. As soon as the baby was born, an attorney could file the applications for DNA, prove the baby belongs to Andrew, and then they could move forward with potentially giving the grandparents custody. Their argument of why they should have custody. Right. Because okay. she's crazy and killed our son. And well, she killed our son. She's going to go to jail. Yeah. Where she should go in their their eyes, I'm sure, and we we deserve to have the baby. Now the Bagbees were told by their attorneys that they really needed to be in Canada in Newfoundland when this baby was born, so they had to reside there during this custody battle because it would show the judge that they were really dedicated to having this child and raising it. Well, so these people uproot their whole lives in California and move to Canada to pursue this. Wow. Well, I would say that would prove that you're um, you're in. You really mean this, and not just some arbitrary thing to do to get back at someone somehow. But yeah, I think that would uh, definitely prove that you're serious. Shirley birthed a healthy baby boy named Zachary Andrew Turner on July 18th of 2002. After the baby's birth, Shirley refused to allow the Bagbys access to their grandson. Now she named him Andrew after the guy that she murdered. Damn, that's a special kind of damn, I don't know, that seems monstrous to me. Well, this woman is a monster. I mean, having killed someone is bad enough, but then to name the child after them? Yeah. And then he he was mad when she wasn't pregnant, mad enough to finally break it off so he wanted a child? Damn, that's twisted in more than one way. Yeah, this woman is just, she is something else, let me just say. And when Shirley's attorney was cordial and, like, encouraged Zachary have a relationship with his grandparents, Shirley fired him. She, she just didn't want to hear what she didn't want to hear, I guess. So even the guy who she's paying, your lawyer usually leans your way, is like, it's the right thing to do. Well, There's yeah, no these reason are good to people, not and let them see the baby. You should let them be involved in the baby's life, and you don't necessarily have a great support system, Shirley, and a big family, so... You know, it'd be really great for you to have help with the baby. And they obviously love him, want to be part of his life. She didn't like that. So the Bagbees began their custody battle. 
it was revealed that Shirley had already been in family court three months prior fighting with her ex-husband. So before the baby was even born. Her 12-year-old daughter had come for a short visit with Shirley, then never returned home to her dad. So not only did Shirley, an accused murderer, have custody of a newborn baby, but also her 12-year-old daughter. Oh my gosh. Shirley also played games with the Bagbys, saying she'd agree to supervise visits with the baby as long as she could be in the same room. As if these people would want to be around their son's accused killer. I mean, that's pretty crackpot, right? (laughs) Well, it's just uh, she's getting some kind of enjoyment or entertainment out of of this. I mean, it's obvious. Yeah, like you have to deal with me. Yeah. Like you have to be reminded of what I've done. I mean, yeah, she still wants to be the center of attention. She's a fucking nasty person. Over the course of 2002, when the Bagbees were able to bond with Zachary, he really seemed to enjoy his grandparents, especially his grandma. And at his first birthday party, Shirley allegedly told her, he obviously loves you more than me, so why don't you just take him? Oh my God, she can't, she can't even let a little baby be a baby, man. And just enjoy, like, a grandma? Yeah. I mean, a baby? How can a baby really show favoritism? It's a baby. It's not a contest. Yeah, maybe because grandma, like, picks him up and loves on him? I mean... Well, I mean, the wall can make geez. a baby smile. Are you going to be jealous of the freaking <laughs> yes. wall? In November of 2002, Shirley was ordered to return to the United States by a federal justice minister. But in 2003, she was released again as the judge felt she wasn't dangerous to the public. So, you know, orders this, then, like, changes his mind. On July 4th of 2003, Shirley met a man in a bar. The pair would date and hook up a couple of times until he heard from a friend who heard from a friend who heard that Shirley had been messing around. Sorry, I just had to throw the REO speed wagon in there. But no, the he'd heard that she had been involved in a murder of her ex-boyfriend, Andrew Bagby. He immediately dumped her, which I think any reasonable person would do that. Well, yeah, I mean, not only she, yeah, she's been involved or suspected of murder and it's still an ongoing issue. So even if you really care for that person, that's like a big, that's a lot. You know what I mean? That's more than a red flag. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, you're going to kill me next? Or we got to go through a trial? There's all kinds of money's involved? Yeah, probably let me swipe right on this one. You know what? You're an accused murderer. Maybe now is not the time for you to start a new relationship. That's the way you should view it. Shirley called him 200 times in a month with threats. She also claimed she was pregnant by him. Now, if he'd reported this information, it would have been grounds for Shirley to lose Zachary. However, he didn't formally report it, but he did contact authorities about what had happened. But he, like, refused to file any paperwork, anything like that. And Shirley denied the allegations when authorities asked her about it. Well, yeah, of course she did. August 17th, 2003, Shirley was scheduled to have her visit with Zachary. She purchased a prescription for lorazepam from a St. John's pharmacy. Shirley then spent some hours in her apartment writing letters. Around 11.38 p.m., Shirley phoned a friend from her apartment, saying she was going to her ex-boyfriend's house with Zachary to spend the night. They were working on their relationship, and she had some interesting and surprising things to tell her friend later. Shortly after hanging up, Shirley strapped Zachary into his car seat and drove away in her adult son's car. Around 12.45 a.m. on August 18th, Shirley stopped at a retirement home asking for directions. She then drove to Conception Bay South, where her former lover lived. Now, her boyfriend, or this ex-boyfriend, worked for an emergency ambulance service, and it was just a short distance from his home, like around the corner from where he lived. She parked her car by his house, and this is where it's kind of odd, Dylan. She leaves behind a used tampon. Oh. And photographs of herself and Zachary, uh, like, on the front seat of her car. Okay, so um, here's this used tampon and some pictures of me and my baby. That's interesting. What was she trying to, what kind of message was that? 
Well, she had told him she was pregnant with his child, so maybe this was to oh. say, like, I'm not pregnant. Oh, my God, it is. Or maybe she's just kind of weird and wants to, like, leave behind a tampon. Maybe he had a tampon, a used tampon. I don't know. No, you nailed it the first time. That's I'm what just going to guess this is like a I'm not pregnant message. Oh, Jesus, you could have left me a handwritten note. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> right? I don't even, I don't, I'm speechless. I don't know. Not that I'm freaked out by tampons or periods. They don't bother me a bit. Really? But. I'm grossed out by my own period, so I don't want to have to, like, talk about somebody else's or see it. Oh, baby, it don't bother me. Okay. Enough. One photograph was Shirley in her bra and undies, and the other was a picture of Shirley holding Zachary. She placed some photos under his car in the driveway. She mixed the, the lorazepam into Zachary's baby formula, and then she took a large dosage herself. She strapped Zachary to her chest, one of those little baby carriers, you know, the little baby wearers. And she walked along a footpath to a coastal road near a rocky beach. She followed this road to Fox Trap Marina. Around 2.30 or 3 a.m., a security guard at the marina reported having heard a child crying. It was dark, raining heavily, but he only saw like a shadowy figure in the distance. So he kind of like steps out of his little security guard shack and he calls out to the person and they didn't respond and then he just sees them disappear. Oh my gosh. Shirley Jane Turner, clutching her 13-month-old son, jumped off the fishing wharf into the ocean. Shirley Turner killed herself and she took her young son along. See, even in the end when she decided she can't, own up to the responsibility of what she's done. I'm sure that's what's weighing on her mind. She's lost control of everything now. She's going to take her son with her because she's that selfish and wants to control things. And she had these loving grandparents who she knew her son had a connection with. And they, and I'm sure she could guess they would raise him well and dote on him and he'd be, you know, in a really great home and took the baby with her. I, I just don't get it. And these poor people, the Bagbees, I feel so sorry for them because they have experienced tremendous loss. First their son and now their grandchild. Yeah, and they've been fighting all this time since the day the baby was born to get control of him. I understand exactly why I would do the same thing. And now she's took that away from them as well. This is absolutely a heartbreaking story. Shirley Turner's son reported his mother and half-brother missing, and it was about a day and a half later that police informed the Bagbees what had happened. Now, initially, they assumed Shirley had taken Zachary and hit the road to avoid prosecution. So the police are like, she's missing, grandson's missing, we think she's fled. But it was several days later that the bodies of a woman and a baby were discovered on Manuel's Beach, and the Bagbees they knew in their heart that these bodies had to be Shirley and Zachary. But they went to make a positive identification anyway. This was eight months after a judge said Shirley was not a danger to the public or anyone else. And she was still getting regular visitations with her child. After all this history of being unstable, all the things she's done, the obsessive, dangerous... Yeah, I mean, being she still accused, has custody of him. Being I mean, accused the grandparents of, are allowed some visits, but, like, he's in Shirley's custody. Yeah, being accused of murdering the baby's father. I, I don't get how in the world she had access to this child at all. Even if the child wasn't taken and placed with the grandparents while that was still being figured out, that child, in my in my mind, should have been in state custody, someone's custody, foster care or something. Oh, this was an epic failure. Well, the Backbees have since become activists. In 2009, they worked with a politician to implement Zachary's bill, which would change the criminal code of conduct in Canada to allow courts to refuse bail to those accused of serious crimes in the name of protecting children. You think that would be the law anyway? The Turner Report and investigation was launched and released detailing how Zachary's death was preventable and that the social service system had failed the child. It made 29 recommendations for change, which, you know, the social services system took into consideration and worked to make those changes. So that's positive. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it saves one one other child, that could be the only positive thing to come out of this. 
if you're interested in the resources I use today, there is a memoir called Dance with the Devil, A Memoir of Murder and Loss by David Bagby, Andrew's father. It was published in 2007. Fucking heartbreaking book. Really? Yeah. I mean, there were several times I found myself like almost feeling like I was about to tear up. Because it's his words, his viewpoint on everything. And this man listening to or just reading the way he describes like his wife and what she was going through. I mean, wow. it was like you could just tell he like really loved his wife. Her name is Kate. And just watching her. I mean, he's suffering as well, but just like watching his wife suffer on top of his loss is so pitiful. Sounds very sad. It is really sad. There's also a documentary that was made by Andrew's best friend in 2008. It's called Dear Zachary. I believe you can stream it on Prime. And it's a very good. It's got a lot of home videos. It's sort of like a letter to Zachary showing him what his dad was like. Oh, wow. But it's very moving. It's a good documentary if you're interested in learning more about this case. Well, yeah. I mean, you can see that it seems not just the par- his parents, but other people were moved to put his story out there, Andrew's story. And just, uh, you know, I mean, wow. You know, I mean, the loss seems to have been a big loss for many people in this situation that knew Andrew. You know, in this case is semi-famous. I'm going to say it's probably one of the more, like, popular true crime stories that we've covered, Dylan, because of the fact that she did flee to Canada. There was the whole extradition. You know, this kind of was long and drawn out in court and made the news, obviously, because it was just such an odd story. Right. And then... With her dual citizenship. Having killed him, being accused of murder. Having a baby. And then the baby... And then the custody battle. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts to the story. It is such a sad story, but I thought it was important to share. And gosh, I just really feel for the Bagbees. Yeah, that's horrible. Loss. Yeah, they'll, ne- they'll definitely never recover from that. Well, that has been episode 120, Dylan, of Mountain Murders. Can you believe it? That's a lot of episodes. Do you have any non-true crime podcast suggestions? I know one thing we kind of rattled on in the beginning, but one thing that I've kind of been thinking about or I guess recognizing lately is I'm kind of over true crime. And not to say that I don't love it because, I mean, obviously we've got the podcast. Blasphemer. But, but, well, I just, I read constantly. I mean, I'm averaging like a book or two a week. Yeah, you are. Um, Lots of true crime. I mean, just for this podcast. Ingesting and a lot of true crime content. It's true. And uh, so sometimes I just feel a little burnout with true crime. I love it, but I need to take a break from it. Yeah, and I, I feel that way too. Sometimes either I just don't have a good, you know, new true crime thing I'm listening to. But, you know, podcasts are interesting. And uh, we were talking earlier about some of the things we listen to when we're burnt, need a break. Yeah, and need a break and try to hear something different. And what are some of the things you listen to that are not true crime when people need to back off for a minute? Well, my go-to lately, I've been listening to more music maybe than usual. Like Okay. When I've been cleaning and things like that, instead of popping on a true crime podcast, I've been listening to more music. I even made myself a Christmas holiday playlist, which I would never do. I don't know what's wrong with me. Oh, you should. Uh, <laughs> you can attach that to our Mountain Murders on Spotify. Would you like me to do that? I think the listeners might like you to do that. All right. Well, I will attach my holiday playlist. Yeah, I'll figure that out. I find some obscure Christmas songs, although I have to say some of the traditional classic songs I do love. Yeah. Yeah, I like some of the classics. I've also been listening to Black Mass Appeal. It's a podcast about Satanism. (laughs) <laughs> and there's a really good one It's funny And the host is great And he talks a lot about like social issues and stuff But it's funny It's called Fat, Drunk, and Stupid Oh, we I've heard him. of that yeah, one Yeah, we follow him on Twitter And he's like pretty entertaining I think you'd like that one And then, I mean, some of the standards I have been listening to um, Even the Rich by Wondery That's a good one American Storytellers And the Armageddon podcast Which is like Christopher Titus Oh yeah, yeah, the Christopher Titus show It's pretty funny Yeah, he's a pretty funny guy He's like a more likable Bill Burr Yeah Does that make sense? Totally, because I'm not a big Bill Burr fan 
He just yeah. reminds me of like my angry dad or something. Yeah, I think. But Titus is fucking funny. He grew up with an angry dad and definitely has some funny stories about. Yeah, that. so that's a pretty interesting podcast. I don't know if you're looking for suggestions. Yeah, and you said famous fates. Famous fates is a good one, and another one that I've been listening to, and it's not necessarily true crime, but. I guess, you know, it's got a, like a little edge to it is The Dark Side Of, which is a podcast. Oh, I've yeah. I've been listening to it on Spotify, but they have some pretty interesting stuff. The ones um, I've been listening to this uh, cu- past couple of days is about the 90s. And so they kind of explore some of the darker sides of the 90s. They talk about like Beanie Babies. There is an episode called Teen Spirit. Which is pretty interesting because it ta- it's like basically discussing teenagers that came out of the 90s. So totally our generation. Like the grunge scene and all yeah, that. Yeah, and how like Generation X, how we're just kind of like this overlooked generation. But that we actually experienced a lot as teenagers in the 90s. That it was like a turning point for kids. Oh yeah, it's, it was the beginning of the turning point to where it's gotten now with millennials. And we talked about this the other day. We kind of, we took some things from the boomer generation you know, good things. And, you know, I know boomers get the, a, hard, a bad rap nowadays, but not all boomers are bad, and everything about the boomers is not bad. So we took some things away from them, but we also were at the beginning of the birth of the Internet and moving to where we are nowadays. So we kind of were a very transitional generation. Well, I feel like our generation was definitely a little different because we, we were more of like the latchkey generation. Like, we were the first generation, like, Generation X to come through where we had, like, working parents, both parents working. A lot of us came from broken homes. Yep. Divorce rates were starting to climb yep. intensely in the 70s and early 80s. And, yep. So we were left alone a lot, unattended a lot. Many of us maybe felt kind of neglected. Well, and, and the jobs started leaving. You know, the job market started contracting, changing. Manufacturing wasn't the heart of the middle class anymore. And, and we lived through that, too. And I, I think sometimes the younger people and stuff think, like, with the job market and things like that, that it's uh, just them dealing with it. But we deal, dealt with it in different ways. And even as adults, dealt with it as well. Well, yeah, we grew up at a time where we were first introduced to AIDS. And so we were a generation that grew up with lots of news about AIDS and people dying. And it was very scary. Um, we had the L.A. riots in 92, and there were still a lot of uh, racial tensions in this country. And I feel like that really showcased those issues to me as a young person. Because, I mean, I live in Appalachia. I'm in the mountains. I'm in a rural community. Not a lot of people of color here. And, you know, growing up, I'm sure that my friends of color experienced racism and, and probably things I I didn't re- really recognize or what was going on. But I felt like overall... We had a pretty harmonious group of kids at school, and it seemed like everybody was kind of cool. And so this didn't seem like such an issue. But then once the Rodney King thing happened, the L.A. riots started, I think that was a real eye-opener for me. Yeah. Like, wait a minute. I live in this, like, small town, and there's a bigger world out there where some really bad shit goes down sometimes. Yeah, and we also um, lived through the birth of what true crime has become today. That's true. With, a, you know, like a, the OJ trial. Yeah, that stuff was in our face. And, and uh, the sensationalism, the way the... Missing the, kids in the 80s. Right. I mean, we were America's just, Most Wanted. We were that generation that it was like shoved down our throats like you can't go outside. Yeah. Someone will abduct you, stranger danger. Yeah, so... Uh, other... We had Kurt Cobain. I mean, we had idols killing themselves. We got a glimpse of, like, the drug epidemic with the heroin crack. chic and crack in the 90s and the late 80s. I mean, so when you think about it, like, our generation, we experienced a lot as young kids. And I think it's really shaped who we are today. And I know we get a lot of shit for being, like, helicopter parents. And we've discussed this, like, off the mic, Dylan. But I think, like, a lot of the reason why our generation has become such helicopter parents is it because we grew up, one, kind of being maybe a little neglected? We were like that lost generation. Well, and the, the stranger danger. kids. We had the stranger danger. The molesters on the next aisle going to, you know, get you. And, and at the same, but as small kids, we were allowed to roam and have some, some of our own space. But as we got older, you know, that thing really got turned up with America's Most Wanted. You know, Adam Walsh, all that stuff happened and really become 
like a big deal. Like parents were talking about it, you know, and all that. So right. I think I think what's made us helicopter parents is at times some of us felt neglected, you know, because our parents were being pulled in multiple directions. And so we feel... Uh, well, and I think every generation always has that mentality of like you want better for your kids than right. what you had. So it's made us helicopter parents, but I also feel like there's some downside to that in that we like have spoiled our kids yes. so fucking much. Yes. Today. Yes, but well, well through Which trying to protect them like from the shaggy-haired stranger and all that, it's created us into helicopter parents. And that's what people's always like kids nowadays. And I'm like, we raised these kids. Why are you acting like you don't know why? Well, maybe you should, you know, get your kid up and make them the do some damn chores. The trophy kids belong yes. to people who are our age. So, yeah, when I hear people make cracks about that, I'm like, but these are your kids, too. These are your kids that you raised. <laughs> so, anyway, um, you know, on some other podcasts, they don't recommend. You know, they always want to talk about just themselves, but not here at Mountain Murders because we're real true crime fans. And uh, Parcast is a pretty cool network. I think they're exclusive to Spotify now, which you can get for free. Not getting paid for any of this. But um, they have some very interesting things, some of the scripted um, podcasts, some reenactments, and they're and pretty cool. One of my other favorite, like, do-it-yourself podcasts, which I love the indie podcasts, we're a small but fierce group out there, is Near Death Dolls. Now, once in a blue moon, they'll cover true crime, but they cover, like, spooky, ghosts, paranoia. Morbid Or paranoia. Stuff. Paranormal. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and they and they cover like a lot of legends in your state, that kind of thing, and uh, they're fun. So that's another podcast I like to take a break from true crime and kind of listen to some of their fun episodes. I've learned a lot about like folklore in other states. Okay, I'll throw a few of mine out here. Yeah, and we'll wrap it, this up. Um, disaster area. Speaking of indie pods, small do-it-yourself outfit. Um, I forget her name, but the 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 woman is very good. She recounts major disasters. From when it started through, you know, how many people died. Oh, that's interesting. Like Titanic, um, stampedes and soccer stadiums. Get a bit of that history lesson. Yes. She's very good, well-researched, and so that's pretty cool. Disaster area. Uh, business Wars, which is... Oh, um, you love that. <laughs> it might sound funny, but it's actually, being a true crime buff, it's in very interesting listening to these major companies go against each other in these rivalries. And so that's very awesome. And uh, yeah, I got schooled on denim and blue jeans. Oh yeah, just listen to in leave the, on the car in like the car ride the other day. Levi's so, and Wrangler, so son. For that, they went at it until the slack, the slack crowd, you know, tried to fight back. Damn those bugle boys! <laughs> and um, American Innovations. It's about inventors and uh, famous inventors, and they did a whole series on women invent inventors inventions. Ama amazing. It's amazing that some of the women, some of the things they made, and they just don't get any credit I've for it. I've heard you recommend that to our daughters like multiple times, and then they just ignore you, but you're really passionate about that one. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> okay, that's a few I listen to to take a break. Okay, guys. Well, maybe this month, uh, maybe you're feeling a little down. Podcasts, you turn your attention to podcasts and other forms of entertainment to kind of take your mind off things. So maybe some of those recommendations will uh, come through for you. Yeah, and we'll thank our patrons who sponsored this episode again. And you can uh, check us out over there on Patreon. And you can get ad free content and That's a lot true. of bonus material. I always forget the ad free experience. That is one of the best things about joining us on Patreon. Our normal, like regular Mountain Murders episodes are available there for download and to listen to. They don't have advertisements because I know a lot of people are like, oh, I hate those ads, which, hey, you're getting free content. You're not paying for it typically. So I don't mind to listen to the ads because I understand like these people are they're working for literal half pennies. <laughs> and they're just generating a little bit of baby revenue. Trust me. To that keep doesn't... the podcast going. Exactly. And but if you hate the ads, join Patreon and you can listen to us without the ads. Yes, which is always a bonus. You can hear more of me talking stupid. Yeah, I... Dylan does get a little loosey goosey on Patreon, so that's entertaining. Oh my god, I think I'm times. on there um intoxicated a time or two, right? Yeah, there's like an episode where Dylan's a little drunk and I thought he was gonna start crying. So you can see his sensitive side. Well, yep. The moonshine got me. And also if you want to just like a softer side of Sears over here. Just drop us a line at Mountain Murders Podcast at gmail dot com. We comments, stories, 
you know, weird stories you have, anything. Oh, we love those listener stories, and I've actually been curating some new ones. I've had some folks send us some stories via, like, Twitter and Instagram. Drop those in our DMs. So we will have an awesome listener's uh, episode coming up soon. And if you've got a great listener tale, maybe you had a brush with a criminal. There are people who've had brushes with killers, uh, ghost experiences, UFOs, cryptids. Some stories are just so bizarre and wacky and funny that you have to share them with us. We love it. We do love it. And we love all our listeners. And we hope you tune in next week. Dylan's in love with you guys, okay? We can't stop talking to him. Accept his love. Take my love. Take his love, y'all. Take it. Oh, my God. (laughs) Okay. Thanks for tuning in. And don't forget, Wednesday, we will be dropping a brand new Offbeat episode.